Hello and welcome to the Football Hipsters Satchel Edition. Satchel Edition comes to you live on a Thursday night, although you'll probably hear this on a Friday, after all of the Champions League and Europa League games have been played. I am joined, uh, my name is Chris, I should say, your host. I'm joined by John, as always. Good evening, John. Evening, Chris. We've got lots to talk about tonight, mate. Lots has gone on. Of course, this was the uh, the week where the Europa League and Champions League qualification um, was finalised for the teams who were taking part. So there's loads to get through. And we've also got some uh, some quite, quite tasty listeners' questions this week, haven't we? Yeah, some really, really good ones came in this week. So thank you to all the listeners for those. Good stuff. Right, let's crack on then. Let's uh, let's go straight through the uh, the Champions League. We'll start with as usual. Um, let's uh, let's say at this point we're going to zip through a few of these fixtures because there's quite a lot of dead rubbers this week uh, with the qualification secured. So, a couple of quick games we're going to we're going to zip through and then just pick out the ones that are uh, that had something riding on them. And then of course at the end we'll discuss who uh, who's qualified and and who stands to win a tournament potentially. So let's start then with Tuesday's action. Um, on the 8th of December. Um, PSG beating Shakhtar Donetsk two goals to nil. Um, Real Madrid, uh, well, they demolished Malmo, let's be honest, um, with not a lot of help from their goalkeeper. Malmo had a bit of a bit of a shocking night. We should mention that Ronaldo, of course, grabbed four goals in that game. So uh, we, we should mention that. That's, uh, I think he's, am I right in saying he's now the highest scorer in the um, group stages? Am I right in saying that? Yeah, I think the previous record was 10, which I think uh, during the game he had equaled or bro- sorry, broke, and then he's now 11, is the record he's set. Um, but yeah, Malmo's goalkeeper was awful, to be perfectly yeah. honest, in that game. Um, I still think, I mean, Madrid would have obviously uh, should have quite easily, comfortably won the game even if he had put in a good performance. And PSG, much the same, it was a quite a comfortable game for them and um, kept up their impressive uh, defensive record in the competition. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it'll be very interesting from that group, of course, because with both the teams qualifying, it'll be interesting to see who gets who because they're both on a very similar level as far as ability goes. So that will be an interesting one. Um, so skipping through that group, then that was of course Group uh, Group A. Um, group B, then now quite a lot was riding on this. Um, coming into the evening, Wolfsburg, Manchester United, PSV could all qualify. Um, I think Moscow were out of it, I think I'm right in saying, but the other three could could still qualify. Um, let's touch on PSV, first of all. They knew that really, to have fate in their own hands, they had to beat Moscow. It didn't start well, though, did it? They fell behind in that game. Yeah, no, it wasn't the start they wanted. Um, they'd been pressuring quite a lot in the game, and then uh, to fall behind after the way they'd been playing, I think it was a big disappointment. And you, know, you, could, see, you could see the crowd getting nervous and everything else, but they responded well. Um, very quickly, and um, it was a really crazy night for that group in particular, trying to follow who was in first place, who was in second, who was in third, because it must have changed about ten times. Yeah, I was really um, following it. I was watching the Warsaw game myself at the time, and it was completely crackers at one point. But as you rightly say, um, PSG, did they did fall behind, um, but they came out fighting, and they managed to turn the result on its head. I think the key thing with that game is they fell behind to a Ignashevich penalty, very calm penalty on 76, but they got leveled quickly. Uh, Luke de Jong getting the equaliser on 78 minutes, and... Uh, Proper, uh, Davy Proper getting the, um, I think it's Davy Proper, got the winner on 86 minutes, which in the end made sure that there wasn't any issue for them um, and it and it wouldn't sort of necessarily affect the Wolfsburg-Man United game if it went a certain way. And Wolfsburg uh, qualifying for their first ever Champions League um, last 16 at the expense of Manchester United, who end up in the Europa League. Um, I know, I say I watched this live, but... Just give us your thoughts on, on where this leaves Manchester United. There's a lot of talk about their manager and their style of play, and this time they scored goals but still couldn't get the result they needed. Yeah, it was it was strange because um, it, when you look at the game and you look at the stats, both sides had so many chances to score goals. And the one sort of criticism that's been laid at Man United's feet this season, particularly under since Van Hart's uh, taken over, is that they haven't been the most exciting side to watch and they were creating a lot of chances for once. Um the, the one thing they have done well, though, is defend. And just this in this particular game, it just went right out of the window. I mean, Wolfsburg did score some uh, one of the, the second goal in particular from Julian Drexler, the assist that he got for uh, Viarina, I think it was, um, was a really, really well-worked goal. But just Man United's defence just fell apart for the game. Um, if if perhaps they had a bit of better finishing up the other end, it wouldn't have mattered so much. But um, they just couldn't couldn't get the finishing in and obviously they had the the disallowed goal which uh, for Juan Mata which I think was um, rightly disallowed 
mm. by the letter of the law, but it was a very, very late flag from the linesman. So I can see um, why they were so aggrieved by the decision. Yeah, that was a bit of a weird one. That I, I agree with you. I think it was wrongfully disallowed in the end. I can see why so many fans were were annoyed. But I think Matter, although he didn't get the touch, the way he ran off celebrating, I think sort of showed that he would have quite happily claimed it had it have been given. And I think his movement was enough to put off Diego Bernaglia and the Wolfsburg goal. So that was crucial. Um, and of course, we saw two uh, we saw goals uh, two goals from Naldo uh, particularly the winner in the 84th minute and that was the w- real surprise in that game United had fought really hard to be fair to them they got themselves level with a, a Gilles Vogio and goal um, on the 82nd minute and at that point you thought they could go on and get the result they needed and literally two minutes later they conceded and Naldo popped up with the winner in that game yeah really surprising um, you wouldn't have picked him to be the the, uh, the winner for uh, for Wolfsburg with the goals but um you know, just Martial had a couple of other chances he maybe should have done better with. Um, there was a few headed chances that Fellaini had that he, he wasted. And it's got to be said as well, also, um, despite the fact that there was five goals in the game, both David De Gea and Benaglio actually played really well in goal and made some really good saves for both sides. So I think it's just one of those, ni- another night maybe United might have come out 3 2 winners instead. But it's just yeah. the way it goes sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that leaves Manchester United in the Europa League. So uh, more on that later. So uh, moving on then to the next group, which was Group C. Uh, we saw Galatasaray draw with Astana. Another another really good performance from Astana, actually. They they went in front in that game and, and took a point from that. So um, a, a very good debut campaign for them. No disgrace there. And Atletico Madrid, um, they just keep on winning. Don't they? They're a machine. They went away in Benfica by two goals to one. So that's them through. Um, moving to your beloved, Manchester Gladbach went to Manchester City. Um, just talk us through your thoughts on this game. It was really sort of topsy-turvy end-to-end, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, first half, both sides were really in it. Um, Gladbach were looking to counter, um, but both teams really wanted to win the game. No one was sort of settling for a point. Obviously, City were already through, but they knew they could top the group and it was down to them if they could win and then hope for uh, results to go their way in the Seville Juventus game. Um, Gladbach also knew that their best chance was to win the game to get a place in the Europa League. Um, so I thought first half it was quite even. You know, Gladbach came in at half-time, 2-1 up, and then but Man City just came out second half and they actually responded for once in Europe, which is uh, a, a criticism that's been laid at their feet uh, that they haven't done that at times with the quality of the squad they should do and they really put Glad back to the sword um, first loss for Andrew Schubert uh, since taking charge and I've got to say as much as it pains me Man City were very much deserved winners on the night um, Raheem Sterling was fantastic uh, got two very good goals uh, David Silva as well really really important for City you can see how much of an influence he's got yeah, yeah, and that, of course, um, I sh- should say, in Group D, and also in that group elsewhere that night, um, Juventus missing the chance to top the group. They went down to one goal uh, defeat in Seville, and it was one of their former players that got the goal, wasn't it? Yeah, Fernando Llorente, of all people, um, got the goal. Uh, he was a bit of a malign player in his last season at Juve. Um, uh, everyone was saying he was too slow and he wasn't holding the ball up well enough, which I think was fair criticism, but um, he got the he got a really good header. Uh, flick on the near post to, onto the far post. Buffon had nothing he could do. Um, the the sad thing for Juventus was the fact that they had chances to win the game, certainly, or at least get a point out of it, which would have been enough to top the group. Um, Maratta, of uh, all people who's been out of the side, um, got offered got a good chance in uh, in the game uh, twice and didn't convert either time. Um, you know that, that's not going to help his argument for getting back in the se- uh, team ahead of Mandzukic. And uh, Dybala as well, having a great shot from 30, 35 yards out, rattling off the crossbar. Um, So I think Juve will feel they've shot themselves in the foot a little bit because it's going to make their draw a lot harder. Yeah, absolutely. More on Dybala later. We've got a really good question on him. So we'll come back to him. Um, Moving along to Wednesday night's games, uh, we saw Leverkusen play Barcelona. Leverkusen knowing that they needed to win to qualify. They couldn't get the job done, unfortunately. Uh, Drawing 1-1 with Barcelona. Another goal for Chicharito and that, as well as a messy goal. Um, I don't know if you saw this. There was quite a, a, an ugly bust up between Chicharito and Karim Berarabi in that game. Um, it sort of fractured in the camp. I don't know whether he was sort of suggesting he should have passed. It was a little bit selfish from Berarabi taking on a shot where he could have laid it across. Um, where do you think this leaves Leverkusen? Could they be potentially a danger to watch in the Europa League now? 
Absolutely. Um, I think they've been a little bit under par in the Bundesliga this season. Um, and the performance they put in against Barcelona, albeit a weakened uh, Barcelona, it must be said, they really actually, I thought, in large parts of the game, outplayed them and ha- uh, had the better chances in the game. Um, Bellarabi wasted a few. Again, like the the argument between him and Chicharito, I think you're right, he should have really laid him in, especially the form that he's in at the moment. Um, Chalanogni wasting a few chances as well. So, um, Leverkusen, uh, you know, it's, it's no disgrace to get a one-all draw with Barcelona. It's certainly a good result. But I think they they feel like they could have won this game and got themselves through. So I wouldn't want to draw them if I was in the Europa League. No, no, absolutely. And in, at the expense of them, um, Rudy Garcia, the under pressure Rudy, Rudy Garcia, uh, squeezing Roma through by the the skin of their teeth. A nil-nil draw at home to Barte. Um, this is not a result that's going to um, endear him to the uh, the women who are very much sort of baying for his blood at the moment. It wasn't convincing, was it? No, it wasn't the greatest game. Um, you know, it, it was a result that got them through, um, and that's all they really needed. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The, uh, the the one good thing for them was the fact that Mo Salah was back in the squad uh, on the bench and he came on. Uh, who's a player they've really, really missed. Um, Edin Dzeko had a few chances that he, he wasted, um, and Wojciech Chesney actually made some really important saves in the game um, when Barty did get their chances to to keep Roma in it. But um, typical Italian team, just doing enough to get themselves through in a tournament. Uh, just n- never heard of that before. No, no, absolutely. As you say, the draw will be pivotal on how far they could or, or couldn't go. Um, Group F, um, we'll, we'll skip through Bayern Munich, who um, surprisingly enough won uh, against Dynamo Zagreb um, with a much weak inside, it has to be said, but they brought on Lewandowski and he got both goals to beat Zagreb, uh, I think. Thomas Muller did. Yes, I was just going to say that. Yeah, very, very bizarre. <laughs> That's that. probably the headline. Of yeah, the game. <laughs> absolutely. Although if you're ever going to miss one, then then was the game, I suppose. But yeah. but the, the headline was was made by a club close to our hearts. Um, Arsenal winning uh, in Olympiacos, not just winning, getting the three goals or two goals in in this case as they needed. They won by three goals to nil. Um, kind of the perfect away performance for for Gunners fans, wasn't it? Yeah, really, really top performance. Uh, Olivier Giroud with all three goals. Um, just the whole team really performed on the night. Uh, they they took this thing out of the game after the first sort of ten fifteen minutes of nervousness, and then uh, got the first goal. Didn't rush things as they have done in the past. Waited, bid their time, got the second. Again, waited, didn't push too hard. Got that third, all important third goal. So they had a bit of a cushion, and then they just sat there and soaked the pressure up and uh, tried to break when they could. Um, really mature performance. Something Arsenal have been missing in Europe. Um, uh, Arsenal fans will just be hoping uh, you know they can carry it on into the knockout stages. Yeah, yeah. Again, the draw will be pivotal for Arsenal fans, but couldn't have asked for any more on the night and uh, standing ovation for um, Joel Campbell, the former player coming off in that game as well. So a good route, good night all round for the Arsenal fans there. Um, moving into Group G, then Dynamo Kiev they secured qualification with a one 0 win against Maccabi Tel Aviv, but the uh, the game that all the pressure was on was Chelsea and Porto. Chelsea running out two 0 winners and eventually actually winning the group um but what i want to touch on is porto when they returned home from their uh, their defeat and obviously now europa league football is what's going to greet them um do you want to just tell the listeners a little bit about the uh, the viral video that was leaked about uh, some of their fans were not particularly chuffed when they arrived back were they yeah they didn't get the greatest reception ever um i think maybe their fans thought because of chelsea's form in the premier league that uh, this should be an easy game and they should go through and the fact that you know, Kiev uh, had sort of done a number on them in the in the previous game. They were they were under a lot of pressure to do it, and they didn't perform on the night. It's got to be said, Chelsea ran out worthy winners. Um, interestingly for Chelsea, the the performance from the team was actually very very good. Probably one of the best ones of the season. Uh, that might not necessarily say a lot, but you know, Diego Costa was actually playing rather than sort of arguing and with defenders and referees and goalkeepers. He was sort of running the channels like you'd seen him do in his first season for Chelsea. Um, so it, it, decent performance for them but Porto uh, yeah the fans will not put up with that kind of performance no no I think that's very, very well said interesting that Chelsea probably finding their best form when, uh, when they dropped Cesc Fabregas in that game as well so that, uh, that's um, certainly been one that's been uh, talked around uh, the, the Chelsea fans in the days since so they are qualified the final group um, saw Gary Neville take charge of his first game as Valencia manager uh, slash coach, whatever you'd like to call him. Um, it didn't go too well. Leon ended up uh, running out two no winners. I've been very critical of of Leon in recent weeks and their 
the pressure is very much on uh, Fournier, the coach there. But goals from Cornet and uh, Alexandre Lacazette kind of making sure that it wasn't a winning start for Gary Neville in that game. Yeah, I felt he was a little bit unlucky. Um, Mustafi, uh, tw- well, once hitting the crossbar from a corner and then again uh, had a, actually scored from a from a corner, but the goal was disallowed for a foul. Um, I'm not quite sure where the foul was uh, no. in the build-up play to it, but it was disallowed. And then um, I think after that, you could say that Leon probably, after those sort of things that happened, Leon maybe did deserve the win. Uh, the uh, the court was it corner yes. uh, goal? Yeah, the first one uh, was really, really really good piece of skill um, literally put it in the only place in the goal the goalkeeper's not going to reach right in the postage stamp um, and Lacazette uh, running through a defence uh, lots of space in behind which is just the sort of thing he loves and the, the Valencia players looked tired yeah. they, they didn't look quite fit enough to me um, I'm sure that's something that Neville will work on but you know he, he's got Europa League football um, still so that's something he can compete for and obviously trying to get in the top four in La Liga. Yep, absolutely. That was the, the Lacazette of old as well, that finished beautiful left-footed uh, into the far corner. So, um, and typically on to turn up when it doesn't matter. So, um, yeah, no no pressure on them, and they look like a team again. Funny that. Um, but we probably saved the best for last, really. The story of, of Ghent, or KAA Ghent, as they're affectionately known as, uh, as a long term. Um, only the second ever Belgian side to qualify to this stage. Um, they beat a Zenit St. Petersburg side, who I think it's fair to say, played a little bit like a Zenit side that knew they were qualified. But this this achievement for, for Ghent, who are easily the smallest budget team to qualify to this stage, um, it's a massive achievement, isn't it? And doesn't this just sort of say how how well Belgian football is develop, developing over recent years? Oh, yeah, it, it's huge. Um, if you looked at that group, uh, I think most people would have probably put Valencia at top, maybe, uh, before the games had started, not Zenit. But you certainly would have had Ghent bottom of the group. I think most people would agree on that. Um, they put in some really good performances away from home as well. Okay, this one was yeah it was a bit of a dead rubber for Zenit because they were qualified and top of the group. But they, you know you're, you're still a footballer and you still want to win games. Nobody likes losing whether you're in a competition already or not. Um, so really impressive performance for them. Um, actually, the the two of the two teams that stood out in for different reasons in this competition, one would be Ghent and the other one is a very another small side in FC Astana who never been in a competition before, done themselves really proud and, you know, if it wasn't for the goal that Galatasaray equalised, uh, they would have actually been in, got themselves into the Europa League, which would have been an amazing achievement. Um, but just two small tie- sides showing that, um, you know, there is still the ability to find players out there sort of uh, on the lower budgets and with good coaching and right and the right management, you uh, you can still achieve things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely well said. And the uh, the man who got the, the winning goal in that game, Milicevic, he's, he looks looks a player to me. I think he's 29, so he's a bit older than, than I thought, but he looks like a real talent, as does the left-back, whose name completely escapes me. But um, they, they definitely look like a team that... I don't think anyone will particularly look forward to drawing them. Um, you know, granted they are underdogs and they've done brilliantly to get this far, but I don't think anyone will be particularly chuffed about uh, about drawing them next. It seems to me like the sort of banana skin potentially of, of going away from home. So we shall see how they get on. Um, that pretty much rounds up the, the Champions League. Now, what we'll do is we'll cover the Europa League games that were played tonight uh, and then we'll come back to uh, to sort of analyse who's qualified for each competition. So, skipping into the Europa League then, um, we had games tonight. Celtic and Fenerbahce played out a 1-1 draw, um, which is uh, obviously Celtic couldn't qualify as a result that suits Fenerbahce more. Uh, and Ajax drawing with Mulder 1-1, which was probably put that down to a bit of a surprise I think it's fair to say um, in Group B saw Bordeaux um, score more than once incredibly but they drew 2-2 with Ruben Kazan um, and we saw an underdog qualify again FC Sion holding Liverpool to a 0-0 draw um, I think I'm right to say that qualifies them now um, that's quite a big achievement as well isn't it for again a small side um, it, you know when you look at sort of previous groups we said like with for example Ajax have tumbled out tonight and Boulder have gone through and in this group you see Ruben Kazan and Bordeaux go out and see join Liverpool in the next stage that's that's a massive result for Swiss football as well isn't it yeah I mean I must admit I had to look up where they're from because <laughs> I, I didn't recognize the name as much which is I suppose bad when you're on a podcast with our sort of name but um, you know it's, it's a really impressive uh, achievement when you've got Ruben Kazan who you know they're, they're a known team and they've been in the Champions League before and and Bordeaux, who, OK, they're, they're not the power that they were, but they're still a well-established uh, side. So 
again it, it it's testament to to the what you can do with uh, a smaller so, uh, smaller budgets um also you know a little bit of credit as well to liverpool who have had a bit of a turbulent season new manager come in um you know key players out injured and uh, you you might have said, oh, OK, it's an easy group, but, you know, they got the job done and they finished top of the group, which is what they wanted. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, teams that didn't finish top of the group, though, leads us nicely into the uh, the next group, which is Group C. Uh, Krasnodar winning in Kabbalah, three goals to nil. Um, and surprise, probably surprised to all. Now, you touched on it in the last satchel where you said that Dortmund would have to win to guarantee or have any chance of topping the group. Um, they didn't. They they fell at home to Pauk Salonika, uh, leaving them second in their in their group behind Krasadar. Um, would you call that a bit of a shock? Um, yeah, I think it was. I, th- I, I must admit, I think afterwards we double-checked and I think even if they had won, then it would depend on Krasnodar's result anyway because I think in a head-to-head they might have been behind them because they lost the last game. But um, you certainly wouldn't have expected them to lose. Um, they had a good side out tonight. You know, Royce was there, um, Abayaman, uh, Kagawa, uh, Hummels, you know, th- so they, it wasn't as if it was like a few second string players. Um, and they just conceded a really sloppy goal uh, in the end. Um, they had chances, they hit the post, um, you know, Dortmund always create, but they didn't finish tonight. So, um, you know, if, if Krasnodar hadn't have got the result, it, w- it wouldn't have mattered anyway. But uh, it's... It's strange because Dortmund, you feel, are better than not to put the competition down the other teams that are in it, but they they feel like they're better and maybe should be in the Champions League um, for the quality of the team they are. But now that they're in second, they can now draw a team that's dropping down in in from the Champions League. Um, so you potentially get like a, a sort of a more exciting, tastier tie in the, in the earlier rounds in the Europa League this season, which which you know is only good for the neutrals. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on on who they draw, of course, and more on that in a moment. But uh, moving on to the next group, then um, Napoli had already qualified. They they hunt to Legia Warsaw by five goals to two. Just one thing to pick out of that game: um, an Englishman on the score sheet in that game. Yeah, Nathan Chaloba uh, on loan from Chelsea. Um, I'm not sure how many Chelsea fans know <laughs> he's gone there. Um, I must admit, I'd forgotten that the loan deal had gone through because he hasn't appeared that many times for, for Napoli this season. But he's got a really good goal, um, took it very, very well um, and looked quite comfortable in the game. Um, you know, Napoli did rotate uh, quite a few players. Uh, very comfortable in this competition, look to class above everyone in their group, to be perfectly honest. But it, it's good um, to see uh, English players going abroad. Uh, it's something that uh, you don't see enough of, and I think it can only improve the talent pool in England, um, you know, to, to learn from coaches from other countries and their disciplines. Yeah, yeah absolutely well said. And uh, the other qualification um, came down to Michelin and Bruges. It was a straight sort of slug out, basically, who would go through Michelin securing a 1-1 draw at home, which takes them through. So they will join Napoli. Um, Rapid Veen beating Dynamo Mintz 2-1 in Group E. And... Uh, Pilsen and Villarreal playing out a thrilling 3-3 draw um, in the Pilsen Stadium in Czech Republic. Um, that group is, again, another one that um, might necessarily have thought Rapid V would, would finish top of that group, but they have done, and Villarreal do join them. Um, not really a big surprise here, the two dropping out. Um, moving on then to Group F, it saw Marseille score four times away at Liberec. Uh, another another goal on the the score sheet for Michi Bacuay in that game. Very really, really good, really good I just goal. Just caught that on the highs, on the highlights. He's uh, he's he's going to be very hot, hot property when it comes to to January or indeed potentially this summer, particularly with the European Championships ahead. So uh, his Marseille team winning by four goals to two. Braga and Groningen playing out a nil nil draw in a night that sort of got goals pretty much everywhere. That was one of the few dull games, I think it's fair to say. And uh, Groningen finishing bottom of that group and. Ex- and uh, exiting at this stage. Um, moving into Group G, then we saw Dnipro beating Rosenberg by three goals to nil. And in the other game, a proper sort of old school heavyweight slug out. So Etienne won, Lazio won. Um, this result for Lazio, does it sort of encapsulate their form in Serie A? I mean, they, they've won this group really at a canter, sort of clear us at Etienne by five points. D- do you think now that their attention might turn to potentially running in this competition with their, their, their sort of terrible form in Serie A at the moment? Um, it's difficult to know because, you know, if they start winning games in this, then it's very good for them and it's only going to... In- 
increase your confidence. Um, they didn't play particularly well in this game. Um, they gave up a lot of possession to Sintetti, and, and they were the away team, and you know, and they're through in. They were, uh, <coughs> excuse me, already through in the group. So maybe it wasn't a game they were concentrating so much on. Um, but the fact they finished top uh, is very important, and you know, it should ho- help them with a the draw. But there's still problems there at Lazio, and it, it's kind of confusing as to work out what exactly the issue is. Um, they are missing Stefan de Vrij in defence, but other than that, they're not really short of players. Just the form of uh, of key players has really dri- dipped off this season from last yeah, year. Yeah, they're definitely a, a side that are uh, struggling to find their best four. I think it's fair to say. It'd be interesting to see who they get, because on their day, you just never know. Um, Speaking, yeah, just quickly, sorry, of Englishmen, also Ravel yes. Morrison made a rare appearance for Let's Yeah, he's still alive. Yeah, amazing today. Yeah. Yes. So much talent and, uh, <laughs> yeah, just, just getting his start tonight. So good to see him in, in the uh, in the fray. Um, sporting Lisbon, sporting, to, sporting Club de Portugal, whichever you prefer. They beat Besiktas by three goals to one in Group H. Uh, good result that for Juan Jesus. Um, and... Uh, the other result in that group was Locomotive Moscow winning 3-0 away in Skenderbo. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, I'm reliably informed. I think your cold helped with it that pronunciation. It did, yeah. Or either that or promote the accent, <laughs> one of the two. But um, yeah, they're from Albania, uh, apparently. Um, so again, another another name that I've really not heard of. I, I don't have any uh, any shame in admitting. Um, they do finish bottom of the group. But uh, Locomotive Moscow and uh, Sporting Lisbon are qualified in that group. And then in Group I... Uh, yes, there's more groups, people. Uh, Fiorentina, they absolutely pounded Belenenses, um, but just scoring the one goal. Um, what did they do team sheet wise in this this game? Did they rest a few? Yeah, there was a few rotations in this. Um, you still had Babacar in the team. Uh, uh, Rossi was playing. Borja Valero was still playing. So they still put out a fairly strong side. Um, they had, they did have more depth on the bench if they needed it. Um, but in the end, I think it was a fairly comfortable win, and Fiorentina just going from strength to strength this season. Um, you know, they the the good thing for them is that they're controlling games. If they only need to win one 0 they will do that. They need to score more. They can. Um, in and in Kalinic and Babacar, they've they've got two really informed strikers. Yeah, absolutely. They do actually finish second in that group as Basel winning one 0 Lech Poznan to qualify top of the group. Basel very much a, a Europa League slash UEFA, UEFA Cup kind of. Uh, uh, but on the skin for many teams, they've, they've been doing well in this competition for many years now, so they'll be ones to watch. Um, and in the other, or the final couple of groups here, we've got Group J. We've got Anderlecht uh, beating Carabag by two goals to one, and Spurs winning by four goals to one against Monaco. That game was over before it got started. Um, Hat trick in that game for Eric Lamella. Um, Group K, Applewell 1, Sparta Prague 3 and Schalke winning by 4 goals to nil in Astras. Um, Schalke, good result for them. They're, they could be another one of those teams that, that people might sort of look at and think, oh, they might just do something in this competition. Yeah, they've, they've got the pedigree. Um, the the question is, it's very difficult to predict what happens in a competition when you have a stop now and don't restart again until February because you don't know what's going to happen in terms of injuries or signings in January, that that kind of thing. But um, yeah, it's not a draw anyone will want. They'll be one of the uh, fancy teams. Yeah, for sure. absolutely. And uh, elsewhere, Partizan Belgrade um, in the final group, in Group L, um, losing out to Augsburg, who have kind of, uh, I think, probably fair to say, kind of snuck in the back door in this group. Um, they leapfrog Partizan as a result of the uh, the head-to-head and goal difference. They um, they finish on the same points. Late goals there, securing their passage through. They've not had the the greatest uh, Bundesliga season, but they join Athletic Bilbao who drew 2-2 with AZ Alkmaar to qualify. Um, that Augsburg result, there was um, some ugly scenes afterwards, fans clashing, etc. Not ideal, is it? Yeah, no, not ideal. Um, sadly, it's 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 always difficult to say, especially from, from our sort of side of Europe, but generally speaking, when there is trouble in these sort of competitions, it is more from the Eastern European teams. And I don't want to say that as a negative uh, for all of them, I think it's more down to the officiating and perhaps the policing and that kind of aspect of it than the fans themselves. Because I'm sure fans of every club would like to cause trouble in some in some way or another, especially in a big uh, game like this. Um, but yeah, it put put a bit of a downer on the on the result for the night. Um, Bobadilla though, uh, really informed at the moment, 
got a good run of games and goals for uh, Augsburg, an important one yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. There'll be uh, another side that this run in the Europa League might just help their Bundesliga form. You never know. Uh, we shall obviously keep an eye on them. So um, let's go back then and have a look at who has qualified for both uh, both competitions. Um, and let's do a quick rewind to the Champions League then. Do you want to give us a quick rundown on the group winners and then I'll run down the teams that qualified in second? Yeah, sure. So from Group A, it was Real Madrid top. Group B was Wolfsburg. C was Atletico Madrid. Group D was Man City. Very good result for them. Group E was, no surprise, Barcelona. Same with Group F, it was Bayern Munich. Uh, Group G was um, perhaps a little bit of a surprise after their form this season, but as expected, really, was Chelsea and Group H was FC Zen. Good stuff. And um, joining them in the in the latter stages, Group A, PSG joined Real Madrid. PSV joined Wolfsburg from Group B. Benfica joined Atletico from Group C. Juventus going through a Man City in Group D. In Group E, it's Roma coming through with Juve. Arsenal joined Sorry, coming through with Barcelona. Arsenal joined Bayern Munich from Group F. Dynamo Kiev, rather surprisingly, ahead of Porto coming in in Group G. And the real surprise, Ghent qualifying ahead of Valencia and Lyon in Group H. So they are your qualified teams. As for the Europa League, um, same concept again. Do you want to give us the uh, the, the winners of uh, of the Europa League group? And then I'll come in with the uh, the teams qualified in second. Yeah, I won't go for all the group names because I've been here all night, <laughs> otherwise. But it's uh, Mulder, Liverpool, uh, Krasnodar, Napoli, uh, Rapid Wien, uh, Braga, Lazio, Lokomotiv Moscow, Basel, Tottenham, Schalke and Athletic Bilbao. Good stuff. And joining them, we've got Fanabachi, Sion, Borussia Dortmund, FC Michelin, Villarreal, Olympic de Marseille, St Etienne, Sporting Club de Portugal, Sporting Lisbon, Fiorentina, Anderlecht, uh, and Sparta Prague, Augsburg. So that's the teams that have qualified from that group. So, or from those groups, I should say. So looking at the situation we're in now, um, from the Champions League, who would you say of the teams that didn't qualify, who's going to be most disappointed? I think I know who you're going to say, but who would you have expected to have gone through that's not made it? Uh, Manchester United, I think, is the is the obvious team uh, to really pick out. Um, you know, the the group they're in, with all due respect to the other teams, you would expect Manchester United to beat them. Um, maybe people were still looking at Man United as they were a few seasons ago uh, when Alex Ferguson was was still in charge, um, and maybe that's something that's got to change because um, they, you know, they they're clearly a team that's in transition and still needing some surgery despite the amount of money spent. Um, you know, I think also you've got to look at Porto as well. Um, they, they really will be disappointed. You can see from the way their fans reacted that they are. Um, Leverkusen, yeah, again, a difficult group because you still, you they were clearly competing with Roma for that second spot, but I, I think they'll be disappointed in general with their season and, and the performance in the Champions League. Yeah, I agree with that. And I'll chuck in Leon as well as a, a real sort of disappointment for them. I think they had high hopes of moving into the new stadium, being into the second stage and uh, potentially attracting some, some high profile players there. And uh, they've not only not qualified, but they've missed out the Europa League and finished bottom of that group. It's a real blow to their their potential uh, sort of moving forwards as a club. So and I, I think also Olympiakos, I think it's fair to say they'll be really disappointed waking up this morning knowing that you know that they only really had to to, to hold Arsenal to a, a low scoring defeat essentially and yet they've they've managed to um to lose out. So all their hard work in the early stages came to nothing. Um as far as Europa League goes though, lots of big sides have, have missed out on this. I'll just give you a, a list of some of these. Um so we've got Ajax uh, Celtic, Bordeaux, finishing bottom of their group, uh, Legia Warsaw, Club Bruges, uh, Groningen, probably not a big name, but still in, in, from a big league, Rosenberg, finishing bottom of their group, uh, Besiktas have gone out tonight, Lech Poznan have gone, uh, Monaco have gone after all that sort of injection of cash those years ago, they've they've dropped out, and Azen Agmar finishing bottom of their group. Some really big names that have, have dropped out of the Europa League, do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing that we're going to see potentially a lot of new teams going through to the latter stages of this competition? Um, I think it's always exciting when there's newer, uh, or not necessarily that they're new teams, but clubs you haven't seen before get to the knockout stage. Um, I think in part some of those clubs that have dropped out maybe haven't taken the competition seriously enough. Um, some of them will be concentrating on their league campaign and uh, 
won't perhaps be as interested in the Europa League as they should do. It's kind of looked down on a little bit um, by a lot of clubs. Um, that and it doesn't. The competition itself isn't helped by the fact that it is so long. Because um, some teams are in it from you know sort of uh, June to you know well you can go all the way through the so next year to May sort of to play in the final as I think um, was it Fulham did a few years ago when they got there. Um, so there's a lot of games to play. So sometimes teams do not take it so seriously. But for for those sides in particular, you know, like looking at Ajax and Celtic, that's that's huge for them not to get through. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Some big names that are not going to be seen in European competition. Um, one thing we haven't qualified, one thing we haven't covered is who drops into the Europa League from the Champions League. Uh, so we should just mention that. So we've got Shakhtar Donetsk, Manchester United, Galatasaray, Sevilla, Leverkusen, Olympiakos, Porto and Valencia. Of all of those clubs, who do you think would be the probably the biggest name other than Manchester United who nobody would want to draw in in the draw coming up on Monday uh, I think Leverkusen's one you'd want to avoid um, but also Shakhtar as well um, uh, it's, it's not surprising perhaps that they didn't get through their group the fact that they got Real Madrid and Paris Saint-Germain but you know they are a really good side um, especially at home they, their away form in Europe isn't as good but you know if if uh, if you can get a result at home in, in your home game, then it's fine because um, away it's just so hard to play there, um, and they really can score a lot. Of goals. Yeah, absolutely, got a lot of good talent there. Seems to be a breeding ground for uh, bigger clubs to come and poach their players, but every year they seem to come back with more, more and more talented, particularly South Americans. So it'll be interesting to see how they get on. Um, I'm not going to ask you to predict winners of both competitions because obviously we don't know who they're going to draw yet, and it's impossible to say. So we might save that for the pod on Monday. Um, but what is the situation with the draw? Champions League. That's Monday. Is it 10.45 a.m. UK time? Uh, yeah, Champions League and then the Europa League is drawn straight off. Good that. stuff. So by Monday's pod recording, we will know who's got who. Um, and uh, do you want to let the listeners know what we're planning to do on Monday's pod just to briefly chat about that? Yeah, we're going to do um, where we normally would do our little uh, rest of the world section where we dip in and out of other leagues. We thought we'd uh, keep it on Champions League and the Europa League uh, for, for this week's pod. Um, and just let you know who the draws, uh, who got who, and sort of what are our exciting ties that we're going to look at, um, especially following the sort of teams for our own individual leagues. That we yep, good stuff, good stuff. We will certainly be doing that. And obviously, uh, any questions that you've got on that ahead of the draws, or indeed after the draws are made, just, just tweet us uh, some questions, and we will do our best to answer those. That's some really good questions, actually. Um, and that's quite a beautiful segue, uh, is it not? Because we've had some really good questions tonight, so we wanted to leave plenty of time for these. So I'm going to uh, fire a couple of them at you. Um, you can pick a few my way as well, if you like. Um, so the first one we've had was from Rob Parrott. And uh, he asks, Spain and England both have three teams left. Uh, I, I assume he's referring to the uh, Champions League here. Which league do you think is stronger? Oh, wow. That's a really hard question. Um, I would... <sighs> <laughs> I would say overall the Premier League is probably the stronger league um, just in terms of the teams lower down in in, in both respective leagues um, I think if you look at the top end of La Liga though there, there is a clear difference in quality um, particularly Barcelona um, I think Barcelona beat every team in the Premier League uh, nine times out of ten um, but where, where the disparity between the two leagues is is that where we have, uh, say, Arsenal, Man City, uh, Chelsea, or not so much this season, but you know the the quality is there. Man United, those sort of sides, that the the quality spread in La Liga is much thinner. Um, it's it, it's just sort of those three or four sides at the top of the league, and then once you get below that, the the quality of the league drops vastly. Uh, in comparison, I mean, it, it, it's one of those sort of questions that's really hard to answer, and it's one of those things where you'd love to, as a fan sort of have like one year if you could like a hypothetical league of all the Spanish sides play the English sides and who comes out on top kind of thing to see which teams really are better um, it, it's, it's a really interesting question but it's very difficult to, to uh, put it into a 
conclusive answer. Yeah, if you like. yeah, it's definitely a very, very good question, and I can sort of see arguments for both sides. And uh, yeah, I think I think the Premier League this year, I think it's a it's a poor poor group of you know teams that even even our beloved Arsenal have kind of just about qualified. Like it's, it's not been convincing. I think even Man City, as you've seen a lot for that group, didn't really convince a lot of the time. Uh, Man United obviously dropped out, and Chelsea. We all know what's going on there. So um, maybe La Liga might have a a stronger suit at the moment. Um, Moving on to another question here. This is from friend of the show, Simon Collings. This is definitely one up your street here. He uh, he, he says, uh, Paolo Dybala uh, is starting to fulfil fulfill his potential at Juve now. In the summer, he was linked with Arsenal, Man City and a lot of Premier League big boys. Could he one day cut it in, in England's top flight? Uh, I think absolutely. I think he could cut it now, to be perfectly honest. Um I was a little bit dubious in the summer when the, there was rumours linking into the Premier League because as good as he was for Palermo, I did think maybe he's a little bit too lightweight and maybe he needs to uh, strengthen up a little bit. But he's been really impressive for Juventus. Um, took a few games to settle in um, and he was dropped a couple of times as well, which the Juve fans did not like. But uh, Allegri obviously did it for a reason and he's got a reaction out of him and he's really performing now and he's starting to become the star in the team. Um, and that that's a really big compliment you can play when you've got someone like Paul Pogba in that side who really is the big hyped and talked about player uh, that Dybala is now getting a lot more of the attention. Um, I think people had the same sort of questions when they saw slight players like David Silva, Juan Mata, uh, Sergio Aguero, Santi Cazorla come into the Premier League and asked whether they could do it because of their size and their stature. Um, well, Dybala has all that kind of skill, those attributes, uh, a lot of strength for someone his size, the the agility, the balance. Um, he's got all the technique in the world. And I, I, for one, I'd love to see him in the Premier League, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think he's uh, he's as close as we're probably going to get to Sergio Aguero in terms of uh, sort of what he can do on the pitch and as a potential superstar. And it's quite frightening how much talent Argentina have got coming through, even beyond what they've already got. So watch this space on that one. Great question there. Uh, we had a question here from Wolfsburg UK, at Wolfsburg underscore UK. Congratulations to them, of course. Um, and this is a good question, actually. Says, what ties would you like to see in the next round of the Champions League and Europa League? Said, sort of say two or three for each competition. So, I'll let you have two from the Champions League, and I'll pick two for the Europa League. Oh, um, Man City fans won't thank me for saying this, but I would love to see Man City play PSG. <laughs> um, just love it. Two, two, two sides with you know who spent a lot of money, um, sort of been labelled as all oh, your new clubs and not so much history. Well, not not maybe not in Man City's case, but you know they've bought well um, and they're expected to do things in Europe. And neither has quite achieved it. And it'd be really interesting to see those those two teams push up against each other and see who came out on top. And um, that would be my Champions League one. What about you? Um, we're gonna have one each, are we? Uh, oh. Yeah, go go for one. Okay, each, yeah. Champions League. Um, <laughs> trying to remember who can draw who. Um, <laughs> so never no, 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 this, this is no. good planning, isn't it? I I would like to see, um, I'm going to pick Plucky Ghent, um, and I'd like to see how Ghent would get on against, I'm going to say Roma. I know that's, that's a really sort of weird, uh, actually, no, that can't happen, can it, because they finished second? No, they can't draw. Oh, damn, so okay, all right, in that case then, I'll, <laughs> I'll change my answer, and I'll say Ghent against... Ghent against Wolfsburg. There you go. There's there, there's a there's a hipster choice if ever there was. Um, and I go with that purely because I mean, it would be very obvious to pick out the big sides and whatnot. But Wolfsburg's first sort of qualification in, funnily enough, with the question asking it, but you know their first time that they've qualified to this stage. Um, they're kind of a team in a little bit of transition. Um, and I think it would just be fun to see sort of two underdogs, if you like, drawn together because I think Ghent. I think if they draw a big gun, that the, the temptation for them will be to to, to pluck the uh, the defence and, and and you know just try their very best just to sit sit deep and and not concede. Whereas if they draw a team like Wolfsburg, they might think you know what, well we can have a go at them and we can give them a game. So it would be the fairy tale story. Um, so so just just to be a bit different, that would be the one I would like to go for. What about the Europa League? Now this is this is. This is really difficult, isn't yeah, see, it? See, this is much more complicated. So I'm going to try and pick one that's dropping in. And I, oh, see, now it gets more yeah. confusing. Because I wanted to say Napoli against Man United, but I don't think they can draw each other. So I think Borussia Dortmund, as they finish second, won't be seeded. 
so they could draw Manchester United because that would be a huge game. Um, I know some people would probably moan about that again because uh, it's round of 32, but um, just just to have a game that big early on is really exciting. Yeah. That'd be, be a great game to it's watch. Good shout, that's good shout. That I, I I'd be tempted to pick a Manchester United fixture as well. Um, Valencia, I think that can happen. I think I'm right in saying that can happen. So, could you imagine that, Gary Neville? That, oh yeah, yeah, Gary Neville. Yeah, that would be. And, really and it's good, it's actually. got a, sort of a look of you know when you just sort of see games and you think that that's almost written in the stars. You know, it's just almost. Uh, yeah. I think I'm right in saying that Liverpool can't draw Man United at this stage. So that would also be rather exciting. But um, but yeah, just the the, the idea of, of Man United and, and uh, Valencia and Gary Neville squaring up against uh, a guy who I don't think he's a big fan of in Louis Van Gaal. Yeah, that is yeah. that's true. Uh, anyone who's in the UK has seen some of Gary Neville's punditry before uh, he left for the Valencia yes. job. He, he hasn't. He's been one of Van Hal's biggest critics. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, there's some great possible ties. Um, not necessarily for the round of 32, but later on in the competition, you know, because there's German teams still in it. So you could have Schalke, Leverkusen, things like that. Um, obviously, the English sides uh, could eventually draw each other. Liverpool, Man United. You know, there's even, uh, I suppose, a possibility that could be a final, something like that, which would be yeah. huge. Um, you know, there's the Italian teams can get drawn up against each other, or, or maybe one of the smaller, you know, like like an FCC on, um, you know, from Switzerland, a team like that getting all the way to the final would be a, would be a yeah, great yeah, yeah, definitely. And keep an eye on Basel and Saint Etienne in that in the Europa League. By the way, I don't know why I just got a little feeling that that they might uh, might do something in that competition. So, really excellent question there from Wolfsburg UK. So thank you for that. Uh, the next one comes from at Wengerolic, and he says, um, if the Europa League had the same format as the Champions League as in a round of 16 and then quarters so no round of 32 do you think it would be appreciated more uh, and on the back of that do you think it would be taken more seriously by the clubs um, I don't think it's necessarily that, that extra round of fixtures that's the problem for the Europa League I think it's the fact that there's so many games before the group stage um, and the fact that teams from the Champions League drop into it um, I'm not the biggest fan of that although it can as we just said obviously it can create really exciting games it, it just seems strange that you can be a seeded team in a competition that you haven't played half the games in because you weren't good enough to get through in another one. Um, it's, just, it's a very strange and odd way of working things. I think that's the problem that the Europa League has. Because of that, it will, it, until that changes, that sort of stigma won't go away from it. The fact that now, if you win it, you get a Champions League spot um, is is a bit more encouragement and adds a, a, a bit more uh, sort of presence to the competition. But that also then makes it more of a problem because those teams that do drop in for the Champions League, who obviously do have a bit more pedigree, will are uh, you know more likely to take it seriously. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good, uh, good point there, Wengarolic. Thank you very much for that. Uh, next one's from Curtis. He's at CLG underscore the underscore BFA. Uh, he says, which of the big leagues has the best up and coming talent? Now, this is something we're going to touch on when we have a, a quiet spell over the winter break on a pod. We want to focus on young talent across Europe, but. Off the back of that question, can you sort of, is there a specific country you think has got the most up-and-coming talent? Um, I think you'd be hard-pushed to argue against Germany, to be honest. Um, Drew would obviously be be better placed for it, but there are so many young German players who have so much talent. Um, And, I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to list off half the players that Drew could, but when you watch them play and you think, oh, you know, they struggle to get into the German under-21 side, let alone the national team, and you think, wow, they, they could be playing for some really big clubs, you know, and they want to stay there in Germany and really really keep learning and improving. Um, that, that league is developing at a seriously fast rate, some some incredible... Yeah, losses. yeah, I can't really go outside of that as much as I'm desperate to say that France has got a lot of up-and-coming talent, and it has. Um, it doesn't get anywhere near what Germany are producing, so um, you know, I'd have to agree with you on that one. Um, surprisingly enough, England is not on that list. Amazing. Uh, I wonder yes, why. indeed. <laughs> uh, don't get me started on grassroots. Um, another question here from at Checky Nando's lad. That's a great, uh, great handle, that one. Um, he says, do you think the reason why teams like Barca, Real Madrid, Bayern Munich, PSG do so well in the Champions League is because those respected leagues is kind of a one team league. So they can play not at their full percent of their, their capacity most of the time. They can, and they can really turn it on when it comes to Europe. Do you think that has a has an effect on those teams? You know, the fact that their domestic leagues are not so much weak, but they kind of know they're probably going to win their leagues before the season even starts. 
Um, it's a, it's an obvious benefit, I suppose. It, it's being asked from a Premier League perspective. Um, I think that they get the advantage in that they have winter breaks. That definitely helps. Um, I think the other leagues, especially on mainland Europe, uh, the the respective FAs are much more helpful to teams uh, in terms of arranging their games um, to try and give them more of a break between European ties and a league fixture. Um, you'll often see games move to a Friday if uh, the team has got a game in uh, midweek in Europe on the Wednesday sometimes to give them a bigger gap, which certainly would never happen in the Premier League. Um, but yeah, it is, a, it is an obvious advantage if you're a Bayern Munich and you know pretty much, yeah, you're going to win the league and you're probably going to beat most teams when you're only playing at sort of 60-70%. Um, the, the, other side, the flip side of that is, though, that you then have to ramp yourselves up for big games in Europe when they come round. Um, and by Munich, that's cost them in the last two seasons. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, it's, it's definitely a fair question and certainly one worth highlighting. So good stuff. OK, our final question of this evening, um, and they've all been brilliant. Um, this one in particular has really stood out to both of us when we saw it. Um, at Touch of Alexis, and he wants to know, what is your best slash favourite final that you've seen from the... Champions League or Europa League um, we we really got kind of heads together didn't we before the pod and, and there were so many we could think of but we've we've managed to narrow it down to a final from each competition each so um, what were your two? Um, yeah this was really difficult but it was also great fun looking back for all the finals and then going oh yes I remember that game and sort of looking at the team sheets and oh, I remember that player um, but for the uh, for the Europa League um, one that really stood out for me and I remember uh, vividly was uh, Middlesbrough getting all the way to the final and we just get hammered 4-0 by Sevilla um, Luis Fabiano Canute uh, Maresca playing for Sevilla uh, a young Danny Alves was there as well of course um, uh, Javier Saviola as well another player that I'm sure people remember Freddie Canute um, and, and for uh, Middlesbrough some really some amazing names when you remember Gareth Southgate was there Mark Schwarzer I think was there as well. Mark Viduca, the Aussie legend. Um, was he Aussie or New Zealand? Uh, he was Aussie yeah. Italian, wasn't he? I think he was. Yeah, yeah that was it. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank, uh, Ugo Egiog, are uh, a, a very young Lee Catamol. Um, Big Massimo, Big Mac Macaroni, who's obviously still plying his trade in Syria yep. at Empoli. He was there as well. Uh, a young James Morrison, who people will know from uh, West Brom. Uh, Jesus Navas, you know the, the list of players is uh, is fantastic, and just I just I don't know why just that particular final stuck out for me, um, and a, a little nod as we said earlier as well to Fulham. Um, it, I remember distinctly them doing that competition and starting I think it was in June their first game, and then playing all the way through to May the next year in the final. Um, really impressive feat. Um, but for my Champions League one, um, I'm kind of cheating because I've got two. <laughs> Um, I one I don't remember exactly what happened in the game. I just remember remember the result and remember being quite stunned by it. it was Milan beating Barcelona four uh, nil in 1994? Um, and just to, I'll just chuck out a few names from this game: uh, Desai, Maldini, uh, Savasevic, uh, uh, Marassi, Donadoni, um, and then just to look at the Barcelona team: Stojkovic, Romario, you know Guardiola's there, um, Coman. Just you know, really amazing. Amazing game. Uh, also, she's chucking out the manager's names is ridiculous. Capello and your Cruyff. Wow. Unbelievable. But the the game that sticks out the most for me is uh, 2002, Real Madrid by Leverkusen, and, and it's all about Zidane's goal. Yeah. Um, just one of my favourite ever goals in the Champions League and one of my favourite ever players. Um, brilliant to watch. If you've never seen the film Zidane, just 90 minutes of him on a football pitch, oh, it, it's a beautiful yeah. thing to watch. Um, so many other great players on the pitch, but that goal just absolutely made that final. Yeah, unbelievable goal, and, and what a player as well. Um, I've I've gone back for uh, quite far for mine as well um, for Europa League or UEFA Cup as it was then. I've gone back to 2001, um, which saw Liverpool overcome Alaves by five goals to four. Um, it was uh, played in the uh, Dortmund Westfalen Stadium, uh, Stadion, I should say. Um, the manager or the man of the match in that game was Liverpool's Gary McAllister. Uh, incredibly um, but uh, yeah an absolutely just crazy crazy final Liverpool going in front through Marcus Babel uh, Steven Gerrard made it 2 and then Alavas got back in it from Alonso and then Gary McAllister made it 3-1 3-2 for Moreno 3-3 for Moreno Robbie Fowler with a, another goal and then uh, Jordi Cruyff remember him for Alavas equalising with 2 minutes to go oh yeah Jordi yeah. 
the the Babel name was. The oh one yeah, Marcus me. Babel, and then uh, <laughs> Gelly, getting the own goal winner for uh, Liverpool in extra time. It's just incredible. And to highlight some of the names there, you had Michael Owen and Emil Heskey up front for Liverpool. Uh, Dieter Hammer was in midfield. Stefan Onscher and Sammy Hippie was the defensive lineup, and and Sander Westerveld was in goal for Liverpool that night. And uh, they also saw appearances from uh, Vladimir Smitsa and Patrick Berger from the bench in that game as well. Um, Patrick Berger, fantastic. Oh, he did, player. yes. And uh, <laughs> do you remember Peggy Arfaxad, the goalkeeper? Yeah, he yes. was on the bench for Liverpool that night as well. So uh, incredible, really. And, and you won't remember many of the names of the Alavés side, but one that does stand out other than um, other than Jordi Cruyff would be Cosmin Contra, who you might remember from Serie A. Um, and yep. also Dan Egan, who was playing against his former side for oh, for uh, really? yeah for them. Um, so so yeah, that was the one that stood out. So a five four victory, just amazing, really, really was. That was in two thousand and one, as I say, forty eight thousand people there. Uh, my Champions League, I'm going back even further, and um, can't remember why this is. I think it's just the first Champions League final that really stands out to me. I'm a tender age of 32 now but I, I do remember this final vividly I'm sure I watched finals before this but this one really stood out and it was the the final dubbed the Paul Lambert final between Borussia Dortmund and Juventus uh, which was in uh, in 1997 which was a long long time ago um, 59,000 people crammed into the Olympia Stadion in Munich as a theme here both played in Germany these finals uh, Dortmund running out 3-1 winners they had a, an absolutely classic fluorescent yellow uh, Nike kit. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, it that really was. was. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> and you'll also remember Juventus's blue with yellow stars away kit. Uh, a yes. real sort of uh, real assault to. on the eyeballs, that one. But uh, but yeah, Borussia Dortmund winning um, 3 1. Uh, Lars, uh, Lars Ricken getting the winning goal, uh, assisted by Paul Lambert, no less, um, after Karl Heinz Riedler had put two goals through for, for Dortmund. Alessandro Del Piero, what a player he was at, at equalised for Juventus. Um, and a couple of sort of names to pick out for that game. You had Stefan Kloss in goal for uh, Dortmund, as well as Matthias Sammer and Jürgen Koller at the back. Uh, Stefan Reuter, Jörg Heinrich, Paolo Sosa, who's now a manager of Fiorentina, of course. Um, is it? No, he's not, is he? Yes, he is, isn't he? Paolo Sosa? Uh, Paolo Sosa, no, Paolo Sosa is at, uh, oh no, you've done me now. Yes, it is, it? Yeah, I, I had to double check. So. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, I was about to say Montella. Like, he no, went to Sam, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> and, and of course managed uh, Swansea as well, didn't he, for a brief period of time, Paolo Sosa. So. Yes, yes. Um, sure. And they had a forward line of uh, Karheinz Riedler and Stefan Schapwissat, the uh, Swiss legend. Um, so that's quite a lineup for for Dortmund. And uh, the Juventus lineup, you'll remember quite a few of these fondly. Angelo Peruzzi was in goal. Um, you had uh, in the back four, Chiro Ferrara was there and Mark Uliano. Oh, yes. um, Didier Deschamps with Angelo De Livio, the flying winger, back in the day. Um, oh, oh. Deschamps. Oh, the yes. <laughs> and a uh, midfield of Jugovic, Zidane, um, along with De Livio there. And, and up front, how about this for pace? Alan Boxic and Christian Vieri. I mean, that's oh. uh, amazing. And Del Piero <laughs> actually came from the bench in that game. He was a, as a halftime substitute for Sergio Perini in that game um, and he came off the bench to score and Nicola Amoruso was also on the bench that day as was Takanadi wow. so, and Pesotto my goodness um, and the coaches those days Otmar Hitzfeld was coaching Dortmund against yep. can you remember who was Juve coach back in those days in 97 yeah. I'll give you a hint he was a cigar smoker um, oh no you've thrown me now I was about to say goodbye. that's Marcello Lippi <laughs> Yeah, much ever. Amazing, yeah. amazing scenes. Oh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, that was it. Was a it was a final that I can still remember it to this day. It just ebbed and flowed, and was just uh, high octane and a really entertaining final. And and it was at the time I think Juve and Dortmund were the two biggest sides, um, sort of in 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 the in the what was the the, the early days of the Champions League. And I just remember the anthem really kicking in uh, in those days, and it was just a a really magical night. So. Um, so yeah, well, th- thank you very much for that question there, uh, Touch for Alexis. That that really did get the old, the old brains working. Um, and um, yeah, we both, both John and I, really had to think about those before we selected them. Cause... It's it's great fun. Go on Wikipedia and look back through all the finals, and then um, just just click on each final, just going back each year, and then see all the names of players you remember, and then 
Because, I mean, some of them I saw, I was like, oh, my God, he's still playing now. How old is he? It's like, it's, <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's like a look back through sort of championship manager editor version, isn't it? Just sort of who are these <laughs> players that still exist. So so there we go. Um, good stuff. Well, that, um, that wraps us up for, for tonight. Um, a couple of uh, tonight stroke today, whenever you're listening to this, but a couple of quick plugs for us this week. Um, Drew's blog is up on the um, the Hipsters website. It's all about the developing um, situation with Belgian football and how they could be the next big force in world football and uh, comparing them to the, the fall of the Dutch. So that's a very, very good read. So have a look at that as well as uh, Korosh's blog is still up there. Um, as is Pete Kennelly, so have a read of those. Um, Hipster Handshakes will be going up any day now, so the three newbies, they'll be going up. They're, uh, they're up as usual from, from previous weeks. Uh, our team of the week, we've tweeted from our podcast account. Uh, what did we get? Nine out of what EA Sports put on their FIFA? I think we picked nine, didn't we, of that? I think it was nine in the end, yeah. And um, there was a few that we mentioned that we said we could have put on, but we decided to go a bit more obscure. Yes. And the ones we mentioned were in yeah, the Benzema well. being one of those indeed, who, uh, who of course has been uh, thrown out of the French national team um, forthwith for, for from today. That's been announced. Interesting. More on that on Monday. Um, and then the only other plug really is obviously our pod on Monday. Um, I'm not sure who's going to be on it yet, but we shall be back to discuss um, all things from this weekend's European football from the big five leagues. Um, And of course, we shall be posting another interview coming up soon as well. Tom conducted an interview with Tim Armitage, who is a very big on Austrian football, very knowledgeable chap. Um, This will be posted this time next week. So we'll get that interview up as well. Um, And as usual, stay tuned to our relevant uh, bits and bobs and, and follow our account anything that's coming up please do uh, give us a mention and, and obviously we will we will endeavor to answer your questions um and of course itunes reviews if you get time we really appreciate those as well so that's it from us for tonight uh, thank you to john as always for joining me this evening not a problem chris Pleasure always. and we shall return to your ears on monday slash tuesday next week in the meantime as always keep your beard strong and your glasses trendy and um, we will speak to you soon